Mocker's traditional farms are situated in the centre of Killarney National Park and are only a couple of hundred yards from Mocker's house. They were first opened in May 1993. The houses, the boreens and field structures were built on a 70 acre site and are an exact copy of a townsland in Barley Mount Ahado of Killarney. The farms were set up with a view to preserving the crafts and skills of rural Ireland. At Mucker's Traditional Farms we invite you to take a stroll down memory lane to a time before the advent of electricity and all work was carried out using traditional methods. To a great extent the lives of the country people were ruled by the natural world around them. Each season brought its own set of activities in the house, in the farmyard and on the land. These activities were governed by the weather and the requirements of the animals and crops. The film that you are about to see is Mucker's Traditional Farms reenactment of the rural farming year based on the 1930s. A fine dusting of snow on the distant Sleeve Mish Mountains gave an indication that winter was already announcing her early arrival. And yet for men like Patrick Reen, this could easily have been the end, middle or beginning of a season. Such was the never-ending and continuous cycle of the farming year. Few, if anyone nowadays, would have this unsightly heap outside their back doors. And yet back in the 1930s, a pile of farmyard manure was a common sight, and as necessary then as the sunshine and showers were for growing the yearly crops. Good farmyard manure needed time to mature, it needed lots of oats or barley straw, which had been well trodden and dunged on by the cattle and horses for an entire winter, then turned out onto the haggard and left to rot for another year. This organic fertilizer, for that is what it was, would have been about two years old, and unlike modern day slurry, would be almost odorless. Patrick and his helper, John Sheehan, would spread a cartload every hour. This field would be ploughed in a few weeks' time and would produce a crop of grain, potatoes or turnips. However, regardless of which crop, the dressing of manure was always the same. The frost and winter weather would soon break down these lumps and in a couple of weeks they would have been absorbed into the soil. The ideal time for ploughing would have been November or early December. This was most important if potatoes were to be grown, for potatoes needed ground well broken up and there was no better way to achieve that result than to expose the land to a winter of frost, snow and rain. It was said that during the 1930s the summers were better and the winters colder. Indeed, it was often usual that ground could have been frozen from Christmas until the end of February. It was also common for ground to be so wet during winter that it would have been impossible to take a team of horses onto the ground until early March. Since medieval times, there have been few agricultural implements better documented than the plough. Evolving from a pointed stick, simply scraping a furrow through the ground, the horse-drawn plough had by the middle of the 18th century been modified many times, changed and adjusted, depending on the type of soil in a particular area. This plough, a Pierce AR1, with a wheel for depth control and the disc for cutting the furrow, was probably made in Wexford around the 1920s. From the early 1930s and on into the 1940s, Pierce ploughs were dominant at match ploughing and the company awarded a certificate of merit to ploughmen who won matches using their ploughs. It is also known that the English ploughmakers Ransom had dozens of varieties on the market at the same time. Whatever the make or model, the ploughs had all the same function to perform. To turn over the earth, bury the grass and weeds, and leave the soil to be broken down by the weather. Flash, the larger of the two Shire horses, is 11 years old, stands 17 hands and 1 inch tall, 
and has feet so large that his shoes cannot be bought off the shelf. All his shoes have to be forged from flat iron by a blacksmith. Duna, the other Shar, is six years old and stands 16 hands one inch tall. In an eight hour day these powerful animals could plough an acre of ground. Toddy Doyle, the ploughman, would never need a stick nor whip. These horses know his voice and will work to voice command, thus making the use of the reins almost unnecessary. With a fine spell of good dry weather during March, the ground is now ready to receive its final preparation for the planting of the crops. This implement is called a spring harrow and is again a two horse operation. As this ground was ploughed in November, the grass and other vegetation has been buried for four months and although they still look green, it is highly unlikely that they will grow again. The harrow can be adjusted according to the depth of seedbed required. Potato ground needed a good depth of soil and so would have to be harrowed four or five times. Each time the harrow would be set a little deeper, so on the fifth run the peach would be digging about ten inches into the ground and so would be quite a heavy pull for the horses. Ground for oats, wheat or barley usually needed to be harrowed twice produce a seed bed of about one and a half to two inches deep. The two horses seem to sense that spring is on the way, for by this time they seem to be enjoying their work a lot more than they did in November at the ploughing. These days they appear eager to get on with whatever job is in hand. Perhaps they realise that life is returning to the fields and meadows which of course will mean a sweeter flavour to the shoots of grass. There have been various ways of planting the grain crop over the centuries. Some Irish farmers with a large acreage of ground might have found it worthwhile to invest in one of these horse-drawn corn drills. First invented as far back as 1733, this ingenious machine provided a mechanical way of sowing seeds evenly and over 250 years later, the basic principle has changed little. For nowadays, modern tractors pulling a 16 foot wide drill can sow large acreages of ground in just a few hours. Farm worker Nilas Crummon tips a bag of seed into the seed box of the corn drill. This seed is called Murus Widgeon, an old variety which produces long straw suitable for thatching. This corn drill is a star, also made in Wexford, although on many Irish farms, light and cheaper seed drills were coming in from America in the 1930s. Crows or rooks, to give them their correct name, were never far away at planting time, always eager for a free feed. It was said that during the 18th century, one seed in four was eaten by birds, so it was not uncommon for children to be sent out to walk up and down the fields, banging two sticks together to frighten the birds. Human scarecrows. About 100 years ago, another planting invention arrived here from America, the grass fiddle, so called because of its similarity in arm movement to the musical instrument, could sew a very even pattern to a width of about three meters on each side of the sower. The fiddle, which was more affordable than the corn drill, was used on most small farms on into the 1960s. The seeds will be covered using a chain harrow or a bush harrow, which was simply a bundle of bushes, and then the field would have to be rolled. The reason the roller is used 
is to ensure that any stones will be pushed down into the soil, for at harvesting time, stones sticking up through the corn would soon take the edge of the reaper knife. The roller would also break up any lumps of soil and would leave the field looking level. This field will now be left until the middle of August, for in the 1930s, no chemicals were ever applied to the ground. Weeds would either be pulled by hand or allowed to grow along with the corn. With the corn crop safely planted, and with the weather remaining good, it was time to concentrate on the next step of the farming cycle, the planting of the potatoes. The potato was still the main food crop grown in the 1930s, and indeed today is the fourth most popular source of food in the world, coming after rice, wheat and maize. Nilis is making a potato ridge and although the practice of drill cultivating has been around for almost a century, the age-old art of growing the potato crop in ridges was and still is popular. Many believe that a larger crop could be produced using this method. During the 19th century, a family of eight could have survived on one acre of potatoes. The ridge would be given a good dressing of farmyard manure, the potato seed planted on top and then covered up with soil. As the young plants were growing, more soil would have been added every two weeks or so. Making potato ridges was slow work. A man would have to work long and hard to achieve an acre in a week. By the middle of the 19th century, there were almost 9 million people in Ireland, and every available acre of land was being used to produce food. When the potato blight struck in 1845, one million people died of hunger, and between 1845 and 1855, a further two million emigrated because of the food shortage. Traces of old potato ridges can still be seen on most Irish hillsides to this day, a reminder of how our ancestors had to live during the 1800s. In the 1930s, the more progressive farmers had moved on to the method of drill cultivation. Unlike the plough which we saw earlier, the drill plough was two-sided, which allowed it to open up a long straight drill into which the potato seed could be planted. This ground had been well manured during the winter, although it was quite common for an extra dressing to be spread along the drills and the potato seed planted on top of the manure. Drill cultivation was hailed as a great scientific breakthrough in farming circles, for after the drill plough, many other implements evolved. For example, machines for scuffling and eventually harvesting the crop by mechanical means. On the larger farms, up to an acre a day could be planted, using both men and horses. The setting of the seed was usually woman's work, as was the spreading of the manure onto the drills. The potato seed would have been set at about 10 inches apart. Dennis is setting the seed from a bag apron, although they might also have been set from boxes or buckets. The seed potatoes being used are called Kerr's Pinks and should produce a crop of good eating potatoes. Other popular varieties would have been Aran Banner or Golden Wonder. It was usual that in a field of potatoes, four or six drills would have been left for turnips, although it was not uncommon then to have seen a whole field of turnips. The turnips, however, were not set until June, when the risk of the turnip fly had diminished. Turnips made a good table vegetable, 
and would also have been used for animal feeding. They are a hardy vegetable and could stand the most severe of frosts. It was not unusual for them to be left in the ground all winter. It was always a relief to see the crops safely planted. Although for the farmer there was no time for relaxing, farm life then as today meant a 14-hour day and a 7-day week. Regardless of the work to be done in the fields, John Sheenan has to perform the twice daily task of bringing in and milking the cow by hand. This shorthorn cow was a hardy breed, producing both good quality milk and beef. Shorthorns were by the 1930s one of the most popular breeds in Ireland. They were quite small and were sometimes called the poor man's cow. On very poor farms, People and animals often ate and slept in the same living space. For a poor farming family, the untimely death of a cow or donkey could have left the family destitute, so it might be understandable why the cow would have been kept in the warmth of the house in the winter time. Of course a large animal like a cow would also have generated extra heat in the house, acting as a big radiator, an early central heating system. Even on the larger and better off farms, it was quite common to keep small animals in the house. Annie O'Connor explains why. Now underneath the dresser, we have what we call the coop. The goose or the duck or the hen was hatched out under there. They were brought into the kitchen because there was always the fear of the rats taking the, the young uh, birds. So when you were dancing around the house, you were always told to mind the dresser. You didn't turn your back on the dresser if the goose was under it because she'd catch you by the back of the leg and I can tell you she'd leave a fair mark there. So in the morning when you got up, you pulled across the, the curtain and you, you grabbed the goose or the hen and you threw them out the door because if you didn't, they would leave a fine mark on the floor. So the first thing you did was out the door with the goose and they would pick around for a while and eat and they would come back in themselves. So the importance of keeping them inside, it, it was until they were say a week or a fortnight old. John would spend about 20 minutes milking. The milk would then have been taken into the house for general consumption, although a certain amount would have been kept aside to be churned into butter. This machine is a separator, and as its name suggests, is able to separate the cream from the milk. The basic principle is that cream contains more fat than milk, and by passing through these cones, the skimmed milk is collected in one container and the cream in another. Nowadays, skimmed or semi-skimmed milk is very popular as it contains less fat and is therefore thought to be very healthy. This Diablo separator was invented in 1840 and indeed must have been a great help to the farmer's wife. The cream would have been left for three or four days until it started to turn and would then have been ready to be made into butter. Butter was made on most farms in those days. Some women made just enough for their own use, while others made butter to be sold at the markets or to their neighbours. Joan Collins tips the sour cream into the wooden churn, which would have been well scalded with boiling water. Every woman had her own technique for making butter, and those with a good reputation had never any trouble selling their produce. After about 20 minutes of churning, the butter has come together, and in another minute, Joan will let off the excess liquid, which is called buttermilk. Buttermilk was necessary in the farmhouse for baking bread, and would also make a refreshing drink, usually taken with the potatoes at dinner time. In the days when medicines and creams were not as plentiful as now, putting buttermilk onto sunburned skin had a great healing effect. Joan will wash the butter several times to make sure that all of the buttermilk is washed out. The butter is then removed from the churn and salted at a rate of one ounce of salt to one pound of butter. The salt helped to preserve the butter. There were no fridges in Ireland in the 1930s.
The fungus that caused the potato blight in 1845 has never gone away. Indeed, for modern-day farmers, there is a big fear that blight could still devastate their potato crop. A spray for killing the fungus was developed in 1882. A Frenchman named Bordeaux discovered quite by accident that the mixture of copper sulfate and washing soda, which he was using on his grapevines, was able to kill the fungus that caused the potato blight. By the 1890s, there was a major drive in Ireland to introduce this new miracle spray, which would ensure that the potatoes would never again be destroyed by blight. Duna is pulling the potato sprayer, another implement suitable for use only when the potatoes are grown in raised drills. Like the corn drill and the turnip sore, this sprayer was also manufactured by the Star Company from Wexford and would have been quite a pull for one horse. The big wheels of the sprayer drive the gear mechanism inside, which in turn drives the pump, causing a fine spray to be emitted, not only onto the leaves of the potatoes, but to the stalks and underneath as well. Patrick, as well as driving, will have to keep a close eye on the nozzles, for they were very apt to block with the smallest particle of dust. If the weather is dry, there would be a less chance of blight. If the weather is warm and damp like it is now, this would be a very dangerous time, so Patrick will spray the potatoes every 10 days. Towards the end of June, the young turnip plants are growing well. The warm, damp weather is encouraging their growth. Unfortunately, this good growing weather is ideally suited for the growth of weeds and grass, which by the end of the month are looking like they are going to choke the young turnips. A team of workers has been sent to the field to weed the turnip plot. Some extra assistance is given to the weeders by this one horse drawn scuffler. The scuffler is pulled along the bottom of the drill, disturbing the grass and weeds, but not touching the centre of the drill. The scuffler has loosened the soil and weeds, making the job of hoeing and weeding easier. Weeding, while as necessary as any other job on the farm, was never a popular occupation. The weeds and grass are pulled, the soil is then shaken off the roots, and they are then left lying to dry and hopefully die in the sun. If the weather is dry through July and August, one weeding might be enough, for as the turnips grow they will be able to ward off any new weeds and competing for space in the drills. Annie too is weeding her garden. Using a hoe, she will remove any weeds around her plot of cabbage and onions. These vegetables would have been sown at about the same time as the potato ridges were made. The garden potatoes have also been sprayed for blight and will be every 10 days until digging time. The horse sprayer could not have come in here. These potatoes were sprayed using a watering can or knapsack. Most farming activities throughout the year are dependent one way or another on the weather. A moderate rainfall and a reasonable amount of heat is needed to make the crops grow. After a night of soft rain there was nothing better than a gentle breeze to dry the ground, followed by a generous amount of sunshine. This combination inevitably gave the deserved result of a good crop. At no time of the year is the farmer more anxious about weather conditions than at haymaking. Nowadays hay would be saved in late May or early June. In the 1930s, however, it would not have been cut until early or mid-July. It was discovered that as grass ages, it becomes less nutritious. Hay is produced by cutting down a meadow of grass, turning it over a couple of times during a five day period, taking it into the barn and leaving it there to be fed to the animals over the winter. That was the simple basic principle of hay making. It was seldom as easy a process as that. Weather forecasting in the 1930s was not very accurate. 
Some would say that little has changed on the forecasting front in the past 70 years. So at haymaking time, there was a lot of studying the moon, the sky at night, and various other signs which were supposed to foretell what the weather was going to be. Rain on cut grass washes out the nutrients, as does too much sun. Overworking with machinery was also not recommended if you wanted good hay. So when the weather looked settled, the mowing of the hay would begin. With one field down and in the process of being saved, Patrick is just starting the second sward of a heavier crop. This grass is damp and sticks in the cutting bar of the mowing machine. Something has to give, and it is the metal shaft of the mowing machine. There will be no more mowing today. Breaking a metal shaft like this shows the power that these two horses have. Ordering and receiving a new part for a machine back in the 30s could have taken a very long time, so broken parts were often repaired rather than replaced. Some craftspeople, such as the village blacksmith, were essential to the farmers, not only for shoeing the horses, but also for repairing broken farm implements. People like Jimmy Chalky would have held a special position in the locality in those days and would never have been short of work. His blacksmith's forge would also have been a meeting place for the locals and all the latest news and gossip from at home and abroad would have been discussed there. The following afternoon Patrick was back in business, the shaft of his mowing machine repaired and working as good as new. This mower is a Deering International, made in Canada in the early 1920s. Irish foundries like Pierce of Wexford were by this time turning out hundreds of mowers of different sizes, which could be pulled by one horse or two. By 1900, it is believed that there were more than 20,000 mowing machines in Ireland. Hailed as another major breakthrough, this machine with the addition of another seat and a few minor adjustments would again be needed in a few weeks time for cutting the corn. A successful reaper had been developed by a Scotsman in 1828 but the side mounted model like the one we see here was invented by the American Cyrus Hall McCormick from the Rockbridge County Virginia in 1831. McCormick did well with his reaper for he was a multi-millionaire when he died in 1884 at the age of 75 years. At very busy times of the year and especially at haymaking, it was common for the neighbours to help. A farmer often formed a partnership with his neighbours, exchanging labour on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as horses and machinery. Families that were down on their luck, elderly, sick or with very young children, were often helped at busy times of the farming year. The local priest or minister was always sure of plenty of assistance when his hay needed to be saved. It was not uncommon to see four or five people working in a meadow, although as many as a dozen might be necessary if the crop was heavy or the weather bad. In many cases, Women were expected to work in the meadow at haymaking, and indeed if men were scarce, could also have been expected to work the horses. The hay pike was a good effective way to turn and shake the hay. This practice would have to be repeated many times if the weather was wet. It was said that hay could survive up to eight days of constant rain, but if the weather did not improve after that time, the hay would most likely be lost or its feeding value so badly affected that it would only be suitable for bedding. However, nowadays, as silage making is almost weatherproof, less and less hay is being made. The progress made in farming during the 20th century was already well underway in the 1930s, for although nearly all of the work was still being done by horses, Many ingenious inventions were coming onto the market, which made the farmers less dependent on manpower. This one-horse hay turner, again manufactured in Wexford, 
could, if the weather was fine, save the hay without any hay pikes being used. The spikes of the turner would have lifted up any damp grass and turned it over to be saved by the sun. There were various types of hay turners and kickers around at that time, some pulled by one horse and some by two. Whichever way they were operated in the meadow, these machines all had one thing in common. They were slowly but surely doing away with the need for large-scale manpower on the farm. Between 1900 and 1930, the number of farm labourers on the land had halved, and by the 1960s, that number had halved again. Today, farming is mostly a one-man operation. Any farmer with a machine like this one would have been very popular with his neighbours. The horse-drawn hay rake had teeth which could be raised or lowered using a lever in front of the driver's seat. When the makings of a peak have been brought together, the men have set about their task as they have done many times before. It is now four days since the hay was cut. Four days of good dry weather and sunshine. The men are building a hay peak which in spite of rain could be left in the field for a number of weeks. In due course these hay peaks will be removed to the stack and used to build into one large stack. Hay had to be completely dry before the large hay peak was built, for if there was too much moisture in it, it was likely to rot, overheat, and in very extreme cases, go on fire. Patrick and his son Michael are making a grass rope. This would be used to tie down the stack. A grass rope made from hay was quite strong, and in early times would have been used as harness for horses and donkeys. A week later, Patrick and Michael have started drawing the hay peaks from the meadow to the yard, where they will be made into a larger stack and stored over the winter. For many centuries, the hay was simply forked from the hay peaks and built onto a hay cart. Hay carts varied from one part of the country to another. Some had to be low slung if they were working high ground. First invented at the start of the 19th century, this hay cart with a two-man operated pulley was capable of taking the entire peak onto the hay cart. And although a slow enough operation, this method was used on farms until the advent of the buck rake during the 1950s. The father and son team will clear this field of peaks and before nightfall. It was always a relief to see the hay safely in, as the quality of the hay determined the health and value of the farmer's livestock, and ultimately how much income the sale would bring in. As we said earlier, a woman could have been called on to work in the fields if necessary. However, her main role would have been looking after affairs in and around the farmhouse. One of her many roles would have been looking after hens and other small livestock around the farmyard. Of all the farm animals around the farmyard that the woman of the house looked after, she would have paid particular attention to the hens. The reason for this was that the money from the sale of eggs went to the woman of the house. It was said by most men at that time that the hens always died in debt because of all the extra food and attention that they were given by the woman. One of the most obvious and fundamental changes that has taken place in farming is the fact that farming has become more intensive and specialised. That is to say that the days of having pigs, cows, hens, chickens and sheep, as well as growing crops on the same holding, are gone. Farmers now tend to specialise in dairying, beef production, or cereal growing, etc. In times gone by, the need to have a mixed farming system stemmed from the fact that everybody needed to be self-sufficient. One important role for the woman was making food. Annie would have baked bread two or three times a week. I'm going to make some griddle bread. 
Now this is the bread that would be fairly typical of rural Ireland. Uh, your two ways of making bread in the Bastable oven are on the, the griddle, which is a flat vessel I have there. Now this is just plain flour, uh, a spoon of bread soda, a small spoon of bicarbonate soda. Wrap that in well. And let the air into the flour. I always add an egg to the griddle bread because it keeps it soft. Now, this would be a sort of a, a, a coarse flour they would have been using, and they would often have added yellow meal or maize meal to give it a little bit of a bite. And I mix it with sour milk. This is cow's milk gone sour. Now the sour milk mixes with the bread soda and one is acid, the other is alkaline and that's what you use for raising your bread. Now it is very important to put the bread on the griddle very quickly because the bread soda and the sour milk are acting immediately. Now cutting the bread into pointers or, or squares and or soda farms as it is known from the part of north of Ireland. Now I'm putting it on the griddle. I shake a bit of flour first on the griddle. Some people would rub a little bit of butter on it, but I like just to put the, it's less messy. It will take about from 20 minutes to half an hour for the bread to cook. Now when it's done on one side, I turn it over and it gets crusty and I turn it over and then do it on the other side. And it is important that you have the fire nice and warm. So you run your hand under the griddle to see if it is warm enough or you leave your, your griddle up or down. Now I have a, another hook here that I can adjust. So that's important that you move it up and down as the fire, depending on how hot the fire is. But griddle bread, you eat it as it came off the griddle. And that's why it was so popular, of course. Very popular with the children. Uh, with a mug of milk and uh, plenty of butter on it. As the month of August draws to a close, the corn is now ripe and ready to be cut. Patrick will have cut a two metre opening the whole way around the field. This opening is so that when the horses pulling the reaper binder Come into the field, they will not trample the precious ears of corn. The scythe has been used for many years as the main implement for cutting the corn and hay. It was said that corn was much easier to cut than hay. One drawback that the scythe had was that it needed constant sharpening. Patrick and Michael have now got three extra workers in the field to help them. Goats will eat almost anything and now find the corn to their liking. They are not worried about the thistles, which have been growing along with the corn. The bundles of corn are tied into sheaves. Three sheaves will be stood up together and tied around the top. This is called a stook. If the need for farm workers was dropping year by year as a result of the many ingenious inventions which had come onto the market, the most important invention to hasten their demise arrived in 1879. First introduced in America, the reaper binder was to dominate the harvesting of corn in Ireland for the following 80 years. By the 1930s, the reaper binder was a state-of-the-art machine capable of not only cutting the corn, but with an elaborate inbuilt device for tying the sheaves as well. The cut corn is forced down onto the canvas conveyor belt by the rotating reel. 
It is then forced up another canvas belt into the tying mechanism. The bundle of corn is tied and then kicked out where it can easily be collected and stooped. A binder working in good dry conditions could have cut and tied one acre of corn every hour. So it is little wonder why workers were becoming scarcer and scarcer on the farms. As the farming season draws near to an end, the laborious task of digging the potato crop is now underway. Potatoes were usually dug around the end of October, although in the 1930s it would have been quite common for them to be left in the ground until November. For many years the only method of digging was with a spade, although it was discovered that the drill plough could, if carefully handled, lift the crop from the ground and expose the potatoes to the gatherers. While not a perfect way of digging the crop, for many of the potatoes were still buried, the plough was one of the first implements to speed up the usually slow business of potato harvesting. In 1852, an Irishman, James Hansen from County Antrim, invented a machine that was to become as useful to the potato growers as the binder had been to the corn growers. The two horses pulled along the digger, a large blade cut underneath the crop of potatoes, forcing them upwards. The iron forks at the back of the machine revolved as it was pulled along, and these kicked the potatoes out of the drill. All that was left to do was for the gatherers to pick them up. From the end of the 1930s, tractors were beginning to appear on farms. The first people to have owned a tractor would have been men like Andy O'Connell, who in those days called himself a farm contractor. From the end of November until the following March, Andy would have worked a six day week, thrashing the large amounts of corn kept on farms, dotted throughout the countryside. The once a year arrival of the thrashing mill was treated as something of an event, for this was certainly one of the most important highlights of the farming year. Men and women stood outside the farmhouse to greet this welcome arrival. Young people were kept off school for the day, and with a welcome like this, Andy must have felt like a modern day pop star. The tractor pulling the thrashing machine is a Fordson, weighing just over one ton. This model was made in the late 1930s, although Henry Ford from the USA had been producing tractors like this since 1916. As at haymaking, the thrashing also required a lot of workers, and this was another time of the year when the farmer depended on his neighbours for extra assistance. Up to a dozen people were needed around the thrashing mill, and usually when the machine came into an area, it would stay in that locality until every farmer's corn had been thrashed. It was likely that this team of workers would move with the thrashing mill from one farm to the next in order to help complete the thrashing in the locality. First invented well over 200 years ago, early thrashing mills would have been powered by water, or in some cases by horses, and by the middle of the 1800s they would have been both pulled and driven by steam engines. This mill is a Garvey, manufactured in Scotland around the 1920s. Costing £500, this was quite a large investment at that time for the farm contractor. Like the Reaper Binder, the thrashing mill reigned supreme throughout Ireland until the 1960s. The arrival of the Combine Harvester, with its one-man operation of cutting and thrashing the corn, has made the thrashing mill, like so many other farm implements of yesteryear, a thing of the past just another memory of Ireland's farming history. Before the thrashing can begin, the mill has to be levelled. This is very important, for if it's not level, the mill would not operate properly. There is a spirit level at the front and back of the mill. Andy will take the same care when adjusting the tension of the pulley belt, which, powered by the Fordson, will drive the whole thrashing operation. The pulley gear of the tractor is engaged and the numerous pulleys on the thrashing mill begin to turn. The once familiar hum of a mill 
could have been heard up to three miles away. Around a thrashing mill in the past, men didn't have to be told what to do. They just seemed to know where to go and which job was theirs. Dennis, assisted by young Michael, is forking the sheaves of corn onto the platform, where Patrick, who has one of the most important jobs, is feeding the sheaves into the roller drums. Feeding the mill, as this job was called, was a dangerous operation, and it was not unusual to see thresher men with a finger or perhaps two missing. There were few health and safety men around in the 1930s. Sometimes there were two men on top of the mill, one cutting the twine and the other feeding the mill. Patrick is doing both jobs himself and will take a break every so often or perhaps let someone else feed for a while. Halfway through the threshing, all of the men would take a break. Some for a smoke, which was popular in those days, others for some liquid refreshments, not necessarily tea. Again, as at other busy times of the year, the women have, would have had to help at the thrashing, although their time was usually taken up preparing food for the workers. The threshed straw is blown up onto the walkers and kicked out at the back of the mill. Michael and Dennis have now swapped jobs and are forking up the straw to Nidus, who is building it in the shed. From here it will be used for bedding the horses, cattle and other animals over the winter period. In some areas a mechanical conveyor would have been coupled to the thrasher which would help move away the thrashed straw. At the other end of the mill the thrashed grain is collected in large hemp sacks. These bags were much bigger and heavier than anything that a man would want to carry nowadays. The grain was a very valuable commodity and would be stored loose on a loft. It would probably have to be turned a number of times to prevent it from heating, similar to the hay going into the stacks. Some of the corn would be sold and some would be used as feeding for the farm animals. At the end of the thrashing, a large meal would have been cooked by the woman of the house. The men and woman would have sat at separate tables. The more senior men and the man of the house would have sat together at one table. It was not unusual for meals like this to be followed by an evening of music and dancing. Joan explains the woman's role on the day of the thrashing. The thrashing was a big day for the women of the house because they had to cook uh, the meals, um, mostly dinner and the supper at night and usually the woman of the house would try to either have a few relatives or a few neighbours in to help her because you could have up to 40 men in the haggard and I know a lot of the women used to say what are half of them doing because <laughs> they really wouldn't be strictly needed but it was a sort of a, a convivial thing that uh, they all got together, every neighbour came in and uh, they, it was mostly bacon that would have been cooked uh, big flitches of, of bacon taken off the ceiling, they'd be well salted, uh, they'd be steeped the night before, provided you got uh, notice of it, because often the trashing came and there wasn't much notice of it, and then plenty cabbage and floury potatoes and mustard and HP sauce, the flour bag ta uh, cloths on the table, and uh, the potatoes would be piled high on it, and the, all the men would come in and they'd eat it and usually there was corny cake afterwards or um, often there was plenty of apples because most houses had an apple uh, had an orchard so there would be apple tart to follow but it was a hard day and you'd have the children out up on every ditch looking for furze bushes and for rotten uh, black corn to hurry up the potatoes and the and the pots of vegetables and the meat although the thrashing has now been completed and the farming year is drawing to a close. It will not be long until the never-ending cycle of the farming year will begin again. Even though times were hard and money scarce, people still found time to entertain themselves with music and song, in a way seldom seen today. Yeah. 
Oh, 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 oh,